let's first focus on the first part. The interesting is what the reporters are always looking for. We need to know what reporters consider interesting, and here's the good news. Because reporters are storytellers, what they consider interesting is what is interesting in all forms of storytelling. Fiction, nonfiction, movies, television shows, novels, theater. There are five things that make for interesting storytelling and reporters are constantly looking for. The same thing a reporter can write. And that is because for thousands of years, good storytelling has been all about conflict. And when you look at what's on television today, it's all conflict all the time. Whether it's Dancing with the Stars, which is conflict, or the Super Bowl, the most watched television program in the world, which is conflict, or the Academy Awards, which is conflict. They're going to be winners, they're going to be losers. And someone from the microphone is going to say some really obnoxious, horrible things about someone, and that will make it even more interesting. Anyone here have kids? Every episode of SpongeBob SquarePants has conflict. We live in a world where conflict drives coverage. And that actually explains a lot. There's a reporter at the New York Times who was accused of being biased against the person she covered. That person was the president of the New York Times, uh, of, of the United States. She thought it was weird that she was accused of being biased against him because she'd been accused of being biased against the prior president as well. Now, I can be biased against both of such different guys. So she sat down and wrote a very, very interesting essay about her own experience, and she confessed, most reporters I know are not passionately political, left or right. We do have an ideology, and that is a love of conflict, meaning we have a bias for stories about, yes, personality feuds, but also for disputes over policy. What I love about her confession is the word yes, because it suggests a grudging acknowledgement that even at the New York Times, the policy dispute will be pushed to the back in favor of the personality feud. This explains Donald Trump. <laughs> this explains why for six months it's been all Trump all the time, because he's a former reality television conflict show star who knows how to get television coverage, and he pulls no punches, here are among the more mild things he has said. Here about Megyn Kelly, because you, you brought her up. Um, she did push you, pushed a lot of people, but what is it with you and Megyn Kelly? Well, I just don't respect her as a journalist. I have no respect for her. I don't think she's very good. I think she's highly overrated. But when I came out there, you know, what am I doing? I'm not getting paid for this. I go out there, and, uh, you know, they start saying, well, this stuff um, if you're gonna, then I, then, and you know, I didn't know there'd be 24 million people, I figured, but I knew it was going to be a big crowd because I get big crowds, I get ratings. They call me the ratings machine. So I have, uh, you know, she, she gets out and she starts asking me all sorts of ridiculous questions. And, you know, you can see there was blood coming out of her eyes, uh, <coughs> coming out of her wherever. But uh, she was, uh, in my opinion, she was uh, off base. So it was all Trump against Megyn Kelly for a week, and then he has an interaction with a journalist who's known as the Walter Cronkite of Spanish language media. Excuse me, sit down, you weren't called. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Go ahead. No, you don't, you haven't been called. Go back to Univision. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Sit down, please. You weren't called. Yes, go ahead. I, uh, that's Jorge Ramos. I can yes. He's being escorted out of the rope. He was asking a question that Donald Trump said no, I didn't call him. So he was physically removed by the personal bodyguards of Donald Trump. Now, those both are journalists. How would he speak about a war hero? A beautiful day with incredible people that were wonderful, great Americans. I will tell you. John McCain goes, 
Oh boy, Trump mm -hmm. makes my life difficult. He had 15,000 crazies show up, crazies. He called them all crazy. I said, they weren't crazy. They were great Americans. These people, if you would have seen these people, you, I know what a crazy is. I know all about crazies. These weren't crazy. So he insulted me, and he insulted everybody in that room. And I said, somebody should run against John McCain, who has been, you know, in my opinion, not so hot. And I supported him. I supported him for president. I raised a million dollars for him. It's a lot of money. I supported him. He lost. He let us down. But, you know, I lost. So I never liked him as much after that, because I don't like losers. But, but Frank, Frank, let me get to it. He hit me. He's not a war hero. He's a war hero. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. Two So then it's a week of all Trump versus McCain all the time, and it has continued, and it is now even uglier and uglier. You watched last night's debate. He's doing this on purpose. He's doing it for his purpose. I don't endorse it. I don't condemn it. I don't praise it. I simply describe it. It's not clear to me that you ought to be that forceful on purpose. But if you want to be covered, you need to be as intentional. You need to be as disciplined and as thoughtful. The challenge comes when you don't want something else to be done. And I mentioned that the hardest part is resisting the temptation of being more interesting than you intend. Let's look at how hard it is to resist the temptation of saying something more interesting than you intend. We're going to look at a defining moment in the presidency of President Barack Obama. And that is the most important public statement he is going to make in his career so far. And that is the launch of his most important legislative initiative. It is in July of 2009. He's six months into his presidency. In mid-July, he launches health care reform. And he has a very specific strategy. He knows it's going to be opposed bitterly by his opponents. So he needs to dominate the public discussion. He needs to build overwhelming demand from the general public for health care reform, so he decides to start big. He decides to start with a national address to the American people in primetime television, making the case directly to them, and then taking questions from the news media. So he speaks from the ceremonial East Room of the White House, the same room where he later described how the United States had killed Osama bin Laden. This is the room reserved for really important stuff. And from the podium in that room, he made the case. He made it forcefully. He was clear. He was compelling. And after 25 minutes, he took questions from the news media. And all the questions were brutal. And he handled them brilliantly. And after 58 minutes, it was very clear. He, he has fulfilled his purpose. He has fulfilled his mission. It's going to be all health care all the time. It's been brilliantly done. And then he takes one more question. A question from a reporter who normally doesn't ask questions at White House press conferences because she comes from a newspaper, the Chicago Sun-Times, that typically doesn't ask questions at presidential news conferences. She, Lynn Sweet, covered Barack Obama when he was a local state senator. She covered him as a US senator. She moved to Washington to cover him in the White House. And she asked a question unrelated to health care in the middle of the 58th minute of a 60-minute press conference. And she asked a question about the arrest several days earlier of a friend of the president, Harvard University professor and scholar of the African-American experience, Professor Henry Louis Gates, who has a public television show on race in America, and who, coming home late at night from a foreign trip for his PBS show, was tired, was jet-lagged. He had a little bit of difficulty getting into his house because the lock was a little jammed, but he finally got in. But somebody driving by saw a suspicious person trying to get into a nice house in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and called the cops. <coughs> the cops arrived. He was already in his house. They entered the house. They demanded to see his ID. He knew his rights. He said, I don't need to show you my ID. So they put him in handcuffs and they took him to jail. And it was all Professor Gates all the time on the news the day of the presidential press conference. So here's Lynn Sweet's question to the president. And I'm going to ask someone who's not a PAO to respond as if you're the President of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Recently, Professor Henry Lewis Gates Jr. was arrested at his home in Cambridge. What does that incident say to you, and what does it say about race relations in America? What does that incident say to you, and what does it say about race relations in America? Mr. President. <laughs> Do you wish to talk about that topic? Do you wish to do it in the minute and a half you have left when you've made the case to the American people about health care? So how do you take that question, sir? How do you take that question, sir? You might say that if you were concerned by the issue of health, obviously we have no other facts in the and in the meantime, let's make sure everybody has health care. That would be a perfectly fine response. That would be a perfectly fine response. That is not how the president responded. So let's see how the president responded as interpreted by the most influential political commentator on television. Here's the question, here's the actual response. Recently, Professor Henry Lewis Gates Jr. was arrested at his home in Cambridge. What does that incident say to you, and what does it say about race relations in America? because that's what men do. <laughs> and in the press run-up to what they called the beer summit at the White House, they began to ask the PAO at the White House, what beer are you going to serve? What beer are you going to serve? And the PAO said, well, we're going to provide the beer that we understand each of the people there prefers to drink. So the professor, his favorite beer is Red Stripe from Jamaica. We're going to have Red Stripe for it. We understand that the police officer prefers Blue Moon with a slice of orange. We'll have that for him. You know, the president is a man of the people. He drinks Bud Light. And the vice president doesn't drink alcohol, but we'll have for him a beer-like malt beverage called Caliber. And they were going to have their gathering in Rose Garden. In the run-up to the beer summit, the Wall Street Journal publishes a piece, prominently in the newspaper. American brewers are hopping mad. <laughs> Brouhaha at the White House because not one of those beers is made by an American company. Oh, and they can't agree on which beer to drink either. So it wasn't a reconciliation story, it was a conflict story again. And it remained conflict after conflict after conflict. The Senate recessed, the Tea Party disrupted town hall meetings, it was all conflict. The president comes back in September, he needs to get control of the news cycle, holds a joint session of Congress, and someone in the back of the room screams, you lie! And that becomes the story the president never had the news cycle. 
The president never had public opinion. His opponents ran circles around him. And what ultimately passed as the Affordable Care Act in March was such a watered down version, with so many things taken out and so many delays in implementation <coughs> that in July it would have been considered failure. But it's all they could get, so they declared victory. The president never had the news cycle because he failed to respond the way the general would have responded. He could easily have done that and would have been perfectly fine. Let's look at how conflict now works. You guys are the subject of conflict stories all this week. Yes, you are. Uh, Marine Slam Sekman on Facebook. Great story, not particularly helpful in general. <laughs> There's supposed to be a picture up there. Uh, let's take a look at how this works in your line of work. Uh, who was in Operation Desert Storm? Okay, keep me honest with you. Iraq invaded Kuwait on the 1st of August of 1990. The U.S. and its allies built a military presence in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf for the balance of the fall and the early winter. They got United Nations resolutions. They got United States Senate resolutions. In early January, an air campaign began. It went on for about six weeks. At the end of February, a ground campaign began, including a lot of Marines. After 100 hours of fighting, the US declared that it had accomplished its mission and suspended offensive operations. That was on the 27th of February, 2001. 28 days later, the CENTCOM commander who was in charge of that, General Norman Schwarzkopf, sat for an interview with the British journalist David Frost later Sir David Frost, on a program called Conversations with David Frost. It was an hour-long conversation. We'll look at two and a half minutes of it. I'm going to ask you to predict the story. And consulted about the ceasefire and had a, well, you know, General Powell and I talked to each other several times a day, or every day, on, and where I was keeping him very closely advised on what was going on. Uh, here, he was keeping me very closely advised to, as to what was going on in Washington. Uh, and of course, more importantly, he was keeping the uh, Secretary of Defense and the President very closely advised uh, on a daily basis. And so, once, as, uh, after the third day, as I say, we knew we had them. I mean, there was, we had closed the back door. Uh, the bridges across the Tigris and Euphrates were out. Uh, we had cut Highway 8 and ran up to Tigris and Euphrates Valley on this side of the river. There was no way out for them. I mean, there was, they were, could go through Basra. There were a few bridges going across the El Fal. There was a, uh, to the El Fal, but there was nothing else. And, and, and it was literally about to become the Battle of Kanai, a battle of annihilation. Um, so we were, we were driving into their flank now with two cores completely intact, and they were in complete rout. And I reported that situation to General Powell, and, 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 uh, and he and I discussed, have we accomplished our military objectives, the campaign objectives? And the answer was yes. You know, there was no question about the fact that the campaign objectives that we established for ourselves were accomplished. The enemy was, was being kicked out of Kuwait, was going to be gone from Kuwait. Uh, we had destroyed the Republican Guard as a militarily effective force. Had, had you totally destroyed it? I mean, in the sense, oh. Egypt and Syria wanted to carry on and destroy it a bit more. Well, it? yeah, it, I mean, it's a question of what, what, how do you define the word destroy? The Republican Guard was a military, in, in, militarily ineffective force, and we had inflicted <coughs> great damage upon them, and, and they had been routed. Now, I, obviously, you know, if you, we didn't destroy them to the very last tank. And, and, and again, this is... This is a point that I think may be lost on a lot of people. That was a very courageous decision on the part of the president to also stop the offensive. You know, we didn't declare a ceasefire. What we did is we suspended offensive operations. Uh, frankly, my recommendation had been, you know, continue to march. I mean, we had them on a, in a route, and we could have continued to, you know, wreak great destruction upon them. We could have completely closed the door and made it, in fact, a battle of annihilation. And the president, uh, you know, made the decision that you know, that we should stop at a given time, at a given place. That did leave some escape routes open for them to get back uh, out, and, and I think it was a very humane decision and a very courageous decision on his part also. Because it's, you know, it's one of those ones that historians are going to second guess, uh, you know, forever. Why, you know, why didn't we go for one more day versus why did we stop when we did, when we haven't completely routed? We're already getting the questions, well, they really weren't there in as much force as they said they were because you've only captured X number, uh, you've only uh, got Y number of, of, of uh, 
of estimated dead and therefore you, it doesn't compute. Well, there were obviously a lot of people that escaped who wouldn't have escaped if the decision hadn't been made, you know, to stop us where we were at that time. But uh, again, I think that was a very courageous decision on the part of the president. How did he do? <coughs> he did keep on talking, and I learned from a Marine the other day, never miss the opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> How else did he do? Good? Bad? He said the president was very courageous. Continue the march. I mean, we had it out. The president, you know, it's his job. He makes the choices. I just advise. What's the story in this day? That's the equivalent of a missile. <laughs> What does the news media do in pursuit of that story? What's the story the next day? So if you're the journalist, Colonel, and your starting point is the president doesn't listen to generals, how can you make the story more interesting? You can call the president, or at least his PAO. And do you ask, does the president listen to generals? Or why didn't the president listen to General Schwarzkopf? See the difference? That question gets the conflict response. The PAO asked the president. The president said this. Well, you go out there. Look at the PAO. You go out there and you tell him this and you tell him this in just these words. First of all, he never told me that. Second of all, he shouldn't have told David Frost that. And third of all, he's in big trouble for telling David Frost that. Go tell him. Uh, this PAO, uh, saluting briskly, said, yes, sir, went out and told that to the news media in the press room of the White House. And this morning, the story is Bush Ames rebuke at Schwarzkopf for truce remark. Move to silence officers. Officials rebut commander's assertion that he wanted to continue the war. Great story. Career-defining and career-limiting moment for General Schwarzkopf. That's the liberal New York Times. What about the other places? Washington Post, Bush, Cheney, dispute general on end of fighting. Los Angeles Times has two stories. The first is, Schwarzkopf says he hoped for a rout of Iraqi forces, but Bush chose to hold the war. The second, Cheney and Bush dispute Schwarzkopf on end of war. My favorite, Bush, Norman didn't say we should keep storming. <laughs> At the time the story appeared, Congress was considering reviving the fifth star for General Schwarzkopf. They stopped considering that when this story appeared. This was a career-defining, career-limiting interview. It is my hope you never conduct one of those. The first C is conflict. Reporters will write conflict whenever they can. The second C is contradiction. Conflict is two parties in disputes, and reporters would love to have that in every story they can. Instead, most stories are populated by contradiction. That is the juxtaposition of things that normally don't go together or that are contrary to each other. So, for example, my favorite headline in the New York Times was a year ago. It was an entire across-the-front-page headline, the kind of headline that you reserve to go to war. It was over two stories that had nothing to do with each other, but it was the juxtaposition of fortunes. Brian Williams suspended at low point in his career, John Stewart to retire at high point. It was the juxtaposition of low point, high point that made it irresistible to the New York Times. They put a headline across the entire front page. There's a museum of news in Washington. If you haven't visited, you should. I went for three hours, I stayed for three days. It's a great place. When you walk into the museum, embedded into the plaster in the wall is the explanation for the most famous headline in American journalism. The most famous headline took place in the 1890s in a newspaper called the New York World, and the headline was, Man Bites Dog. Man Bites Dog is the most frequent headline in American journalism. You see it all over the place in any newspaper. Google Man Bites Dog, you'll find dozens of stories just from the last month. When you walk into the museum, they explain it in their wall. When a dog bites a man, that is not news. 
If a man bites a dog, that is news. That is contradiction in the form of role reversal. Reporters love role reversal stories. My favorite role reversal story involving the Marines took place after the Indonesian earthquake and tsunami in an environment where the world news media was writing that the United States is at war against Islam. And then there were stories and photographs of Marines and Navy coming ashore in Malaysia, which is a predominantly Muslim country, and delivering relief, food, medicine, water, shelter, and the global media would wrote the role reversal story. The Marines, who you would expect to be someone to be afraid of, are actually helping our people recover from this horrible thing. That was a great story. Anything that's contrary to the conventional wisdom has that law. Anything that confounds expectation, any reversal of fortune, or approach, or strategy, or path. Saying the opposite of what you said before, doing the opposite of what you said you would do, all of those are really interesting contradictions. President Obama, I wasn't there, and I don't have all the facts, but they behave stupidly is contradiction. Here's one of my favorites from the other times, it's about you guys. In 2002, the US military were kicking doors. In 2007, the US military and Afghan police knock on doors and ask to be invited in. That's a reversal of approach. Rather than concentrate troops in large bases, troops are now dispersed into the communities. That's a reversal of approach. That by itself is interesting. In last week's Washington Post, as Marines take the heat, the Army stays quiet. That's two different paths by two different services. That's contradiction. My favorite contradiction story written in the New York Times by a Marine who's a journalist. November 10, you know what day that is. Captain James Mingus faced another platoon of his Marines. They stood in their fire with target uniforms, wearied and hungry, weapons slung across their chests and backs. So what comes next? A birthday cake which is not what you'd expect in that scene, was on the table. One piece had been cut out by a bayonet. That is not typically the purpose of the bayonet. The captain, 37, and the oldest Marine in the rifle company he commands had just given the piece to the platoon youngest Marine, Lance Corporal T.J. McDowell, who was 20, contradiction of age. 231 years, the captain said. Tradition, it's what makes us different. Contradiction, we're not like other folks. It's what sets us apart. And then final contradiction, the Marine Corps celebrated his 231st birthday on Friday and event that passes with little notice outside its insular ranks, but is an essential ritual within. Five contradictions, great story, really good for the Marines. My favorite quote about the Marines, you Google it, you'll always find it. It's from First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt from 1945, and I want you to notice she speaks in absolutes. The Marines have the cleanest bodies and the filthiest minds, <laughs> the highest morale, and the lowest morals of any group I've ever known. And she concludes with, thank God for the United States Marine Corps. Google Marine Corps quotes, that'll be on the top of the list. It continues to be spoken. Third C word is controversy. Anything that's already in the news, Professor Gates' arrest was already in the news. You're going to talk about things that are already in the news. The fourth C word is colorful language. Colorful language is words that are short and pithy and active and vivid and memorable. The Cambridge police acted stupidly. It's a really big missile, is really colorful language. Frankly, my advice was continue to march. You know, we had them in a route, we could have inflicted great damage upon them. Really colorful language. But the president made the decision to stop at a given time. He did leave some escape routes. So if you know something, the stories are going to second guess all of that wildly colorful language. Rolling Stone profiled a general, and the piece begins as the four star general who now has to be not only a warrior, but also a statesman. statesman. He has to put on what you wear to a black tie diplomatic reception. It's in Paris. And the piece begins with colorful language spoken by the general, speaking to his aide. How'd I get screwed into going to this dinner? First paragraph of the Rolling Stone piece. <laughs> Aide's response, dinner comes with a job, sir. 
the general then makes an obscene gesture that I will not make in front of you, and says, hey, Charlie, does this come with the position? And this story was everywhere. And later in the piece, there is conflict between the general and his staff, and the White House, and the vice president, and the ambassador, and the civilian leadership. And within 24 hours, the general is summoned to the White House, and he is released with his command. Another career-defining, career-limiting moment. In some ways, I blame CEO for putting the general in that position, but I also blame the general for saying that. And, and that is another important consideration. I will, I will, in fact, concur with that. Having said that, it is my earnest hope that you never commit one of those. So now, the final scene is a cast of characters. Runaway General is a character, and if he had said other things, he might not have gotten into the same circumstance. I'm sorry. Every time there's a new commandant, there's a profile of the commandant, he's a character in addition to being a human being. And he's portrayed as a character in this instance very, very positive. In the instance of General McChrystal, the character he played was the runaway general. Let's look at our friend General Schwarzkopf again. We're going to go back in time. We're going to go back 28 days. We're going to go back to the last day of the fighting. It's very clear that the fighting has gone better than anyone expected. It's very clear that in a matter of hours, we will have accomplished our objectives. It's just before the general gets the call from Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell, asking, have we won yet? It's clear we're going to win. So the, press, uh, the general is preemptively briefing the press corps about the victory that is yet to happen. It's an hour-long briefing. I'm going to play only two and a half minutes. I'm going to ask you to predict the story. All the way back in the back. General, are you still bombing in uh, northern Iraq? And if you are, what's the purpose of it now? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. What's being achieved now? Uh, military purposes that we do exactly the same thing we were trying to achieve before. Okay, the war is not over. You've got to remember, people are still dying out there, okay? And those people that are dying are my troops. And I'm going to continue to protect those troops in every way I possibly can until the war is over. That's all right. How, how soon after you've finally beaten this Republican Guard and the other forces who threaten you, will you move your troops out of Iraq, either into Kuwait or back into Saudi? That's not my decision to make. Yes, sir. Over very quickly, the special operations folks, could you tell us what their role was? We don't like to talk a lot about what the special operations do, as you're, as you're well aware. Uh, but in this case, so let, me, let me just cover some of the things I did. First of all, with every single uh, Arab unit that went into battle, we had, we had uh, special forces troops with them. The job of those special forces was to travel and live right down at the battalion level with all those people to make sure that they could act as the communicators with friendly uh, English-speaking units that were on their flanks, and uh, they could also call in airstrikes as necessary. They could coordinate helicopter strikes and that sort of thing. That's one of the principal roles that they played and was a very, very important role. Secondly, they did a great job in, in uh, strategic reconnaissance for us. Thirdly, the special forces were 100% in charge of the uh, combat search and rescue, and that's a tough mission. When a pilot gets shot down out there in the middle of nowhere, uh, surrounded by the enemy, and you're the folks that are required to go in and go after them, that is a very tough mission, and that was one of their missions. And finally, they also did some direct action missions, period. Can I ask you uh, two questions? First, did you think that this would turn out? I realize a great deal of strategy and planning went into it, but when it took place, did you think this would turn out to be such an easy cakewalk as it seems? And, and secondly, what are your impressions of Saddam Hussein as a military strategist? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, if we thought it would have been such an easy, uh, easy fight, we definitely would not have stocked 60 days worth of supplies on these log bases. So, uh, it, as I told, as I told you all for a very, very long time, it is very, very important for a military commander never to assume away the capabilities of his enemy. And when you're facing an enemy that is over 500,000 strong, has the reputation they've had of fighting for eight years, being combat-hardened veterans, has the number of tanks and the type of equipment they had, you don't assume away anything. So we certainly did not expect it to go this way. As far as Saddam Hussein being a great military strategist, he is neither a strategist, nor is he schooled in the operational art, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general, 
nor is he as a soldier. Other than that, he's a great military man. I want you to know. <laughs> A couple hours later, we win a war. That's a good story. There's a better story. The <coughs> winning the war makes it on the evening news. What gets people to read the newspaper the next day? What's the story? Here's the Washington Post front page. Is that a story about strategy or is that a story about Schwarzkopf? It's a story about Schwarzkopf. It's accompanied by this photograph. <coughs> Winning General, notice the character of the Winning General. Winning General takes on his army's ghosts. Who are the army's ghosts? Vietnam. The guy who learned in the mud of Vietnam how not to fight a war refused to repeat the same mistakes that they made in Vietnam. It's actually a great story. Above the photograph, hard to read, I'll decipher it for you, it said, victory over Iraq was his, not ours. Not the president's, not the nation's, was his. And he was here to claim it in characteristically forceful fashion. Well, Los Angeles Times has a piece on strategy but labels it Schwarzkopf's strategy. Not the president's strategy, not the American strategy, not the Allies' strategy. It is personalized to Schwarzkopf. This always happens. They even couldn't resist the temptation to show the colorful language. They put a box with Schwarzkopf's quotes, and they even cleaned up a grammatical blunder that the general had made. He's neither a strategist, nor is he schooled in the operational arts, nor is he a tactician, nor is he a general. And they quote him saying, nor is he a soldier. But that's not what the general said. The general said, nor is he as a soldier. They cleaned it up. It isn't accurate, but it's clearer. It's more interesting. And then finally, Newsday does say, give the president credit for beating Iraq, but the headline over the story itself is taking Iraq to school, and that's the scolding of Saddam Hussein with a picture of General Schwarzkopf. And my favorite headline of the war is not a story about the Norman Conquest in 1066, the Battle of Hastings, but rather Storm and Norman, the conquering hero. Can you see why a month later the White House is a little ticked off? that the general was saying, not mine, not mine. <sighs> Reporters behave predictably, and that is, they use these five techniques, conflict, contradiction, controversy, colorful language, and a cast of characters to create stories that are really interesting. They don't necessarily have to be accurate or important. If we know that, we can plan differently we can prepare differently. We can engage differently in ways that allow us to advance the story using the five scenes to our advantage. The PAOs know how to do that. But they can't be like John Stewart yelling, no, when the boss is about to say something career limited. So the discipline for the leaders is to keep in mind that you only do the interview for a purpose. And however personally, impulsively, you might want to say something more interesting, you then defeat the purpose. I close with an observation by a journalist from almost 100 years ago. The public intellectual and journalist Walter Littman wrote a book in 1922 in which he described what journalists are all about. What he said in 1922 is as true in 2016. He said, for the most part, we journalists do not first see and then define. We define first, and then we see. A missile! Whose missile is it? The president insulted police. General Schwarzkopf disagreed with the president. Why did the president not take his advice? They define first and then they see, we know that. We can take that into account and we can engage more effectively. Reporters are storytellers first. We now know how to engage storytellers in ways that protect us and enhance our position. It is my earnest hope that you only commit news on purpose. With that, I'm done.
I'll be happy to take some questions, but first I'd like to ask you a question. As you reflect on everything we've covered over the last hour and 15 minutes, what's the single biggest surprise or the single biggest takeaway that you can begin to apply in the work that you do? Then that's a good reminder. Never miss an opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Other surprise or takeaway? Uh, be intentional, which by the way, I need MCPP1, you're supposed to be. What else? <laughs> good advice. Have a good relationship with your PAO. Take their advice. What else? I'm sorry? Make sure you're in alignment with leadership. Make sure you're in alignment with leadership. I'm sorry, here. Who has the questions for my answers? Henry Kissinger would walk into the briefing room and take out a piece of paper and say, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have any questions for my answers? I don't suggest you taunt him that way. But <laughs> I think we have time for one or two questions. <laughs> sure. For knowing, understanding that it's all story coming, where do you get your news? What do you read? Well, the first is I, I read it with a filter. Uh, I read uh, and have pushed to me news on various topics from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, uh, Huffington Post, CNN, CBS, Fox, etc. So I get a lot of stuff in my inbox which means I don't have to actually go to the places to, to look at it. When I have time I'm on an airplane or at an airport, I'll read the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the New York Times, because they're typically available in, this, in airports. I'll read the local paper just to get some flavor. I travel around the world a lot, so I read the papers in the countries I'm at. And one of the things I find is I've done this kind of workshop in 42 countries. These principles don't change. There are storytellers everywhere, even when the media is controlled. How they choose to use conflict and contradiction and controversy and colorful language and cast of characters may be culturally defined, but that they do that is not culturally defined. It is a common denominator of journalism that that's how they work. So when I'm in Jordan talking to Al Jazeera, it looks and feels and has the same effect as when I'm in New York talking to CNN or in London talking to BBC. So regardless of where you are, the journalism is the same. The way they implement it may be culturally. Other questions? For that? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, when you speak to journalists, though, and I don't have the opportunity to do that, I mean, <coughs> when you talk about the five C's, what was it? Did they just kind of smile and concur with that, or did they push back? Uh, I, did, I did this workshop in the newsroom of the New York Times for the Marine Corps. The, the New York Times gave the newsroom to the Marines for the East Coast Public Affairs Symposium, and I said exactly there what I said here. When I started, the journalists in the room, including the foreign editor and foreign correspondents, no, you're wrong. And at, at every one of these, I would put a New York Times story up and say, well, what about that editor? What about that editor? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And with respect to the interesting versus important versus accurate, uh, the foreign editor of the New York Times was really smart. Actually, we worked really hard to not get it wrong. I asked, is that the same as working really hard to get it right? <laughs> She, she's really smart. She says, well, let me think about that. You know what? If I've got a reporter at a refugee camp in the South Sudan, and a bunch of people come into the refugee camp, and they say that they're from a particular village in Uganda, and that the Lord's Resistance Army came into the village and burned down the village, and it uh, kidnapped a bunch of women and children and killed a bunch of men, and we just barely got out. My reporter has no way of knowing if they're from that village. If the village was burned down, if it was burned down by the Lord's Resistance Army, if people were killed and kidnapped, no way to know that. So I trust the judgment of my reporter, and then we protect ourselves by putting in the newspaper according to eyewitness accounts. So they don't have the ability or even the duty to verify the underlying content. It is accurate enough that they say according to eyewitness accounts. That's not the same as a commitment to accuracy. You cannot get away with that. But they do. The same issues with completeness. Because they only got 800 words. They couldn't possibly. So by the end of the hour and a half that I spoke in the newsroom, they all said, yeah, that's what we do. We don't use the same way of describing it, but that's what we do. With that, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the invitation, Semper Fi.
you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, for the BOF folks, everybody in the room, let's go ahead and break to 11.45, be back in your seats. Thank you. Sir, I'll reach out to you.